Uh, colleagues, are we starting or we are waiting a bit? Amrita Odas, we start. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, to those who've made it early in the morning, uh, after long days and long uh, karaoke nights that all of us have been having here in Kyoto, welcome to this session on uh, the launch of the report of the Policymakers Network on Artificial Intelligence, which was set up by the IGF. Uh, I would briefly mention the names of the uh, esteemed panelists here before handing the floor to Mikey to introduce the policymakers, a policy network a bit. We have uh, Mr. Nobu Nishigata from the Japanese ministry as the representative of the host country with us. We have Mikey Sipinen, who is the editor for, and the, uh, how do you say, editor for this uh, report with us. We have Jose Renato, who is uh, joining us from Brazil. We have Sarayu Natarajan, who is the co-founder of Apti Institute in India. We have Professor Xing Li from uh, Tsinghua University in China. We have Mr. Owen Larter from Microsoft. And we have Jean-Francois Bombel, who is an expert on artificial intelligence and capacity building, I must say. Uh, and I am Pratik Sibyl. I'm a program specialist at UNESCO. And I would also like to uh, recognize our online moderator, uh, Ms. Shamira. We don't see her yet, but she will be also joining us in the discussion, especially on the work that she's been doing on environment. And the two co-facilitators for this work that we have with us, we have Amrita Chaudhary and we have Odas uh, with us who are here. So, uh, Mikey, I'll pass on the floor to you first to introduce what was the reasons for setting up this working group? Uh, how did the work progress? What, what is it that the multi-stakeholder community at the IGF was able to achieve? So over to you. Thanks, uh, Pratik, and uh, warm welcome to this uh, early morning session to all of you also on behalf of the PNAI community. My name is Mikey Sipinen, and uh, I'm the coordinator of, uh, of PNAI. And um, I'm not going to take too much time away from our expert panelists describing the process that uh, led us here, but important to know that the PNAI is, uh, is a really new thing. It's only uh, about six months old policy network, a toddler, should we say. And uh, the PNAI was actually born uh, from the messages of uh, IGF 2020, uh, 2022 that was held in Addis Ababa last year. So this is a nice example that the discussions we have here at the IGF uh, meeting actually are very important and can result in uh, concrete uh, new, new things like uh, the PNAI. So that's uh, quite inspiring. Uh, so PNAI uh, addresses policy matters related to AI and data governance. And uh, we have today uh, gathered here to discuss and debate and maybe uh, even later challenge uh, PNAI's very first report. And uh, for those of you who didn't have yet the chance to have a look at the report, you can find a link to it in this session's information page uh, in the agenda. And uh, what else? Well, uh, many, uh, many, many people have worked super hard to make this uh, session and uh, especially to make this PNAI report uh, come into existence and especially our excellent uh, drafting team leads. And I know uh, they are listening in and uh, joining uh, this uh, session online from different parts of the world. Some of them have woken up at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. to tune in. So that's a really nice example of, uh, of the PNAI spirit. But um, I would like to hand, uh, hand it back to you, Pratek, to get us started with our expert speakers. Thanks, Mikey. Uh, I can definitely attest to the fact that the working group 
it's in the true spirit of multi-stakeholderism at the IGF uh, that this working group was formed, and then the way they worked through open, first identifying what themes to cover through an open consultation, and then they worked through streamlining through information meetings, inviting speakers to talk about different topics, and then collaboratively drafted this report. So uh, congratulations to the, the authors, the lead authors, the team leads, and the others who contributed. So the report is available on the website of the IGF. I would encourage you to go through it. It's a fantastic product of uh, collaborative effort. Uh, in the first report that we have launched today, we have three themes. Uh, the first theme is talking about interoperability of AI governance. And this is primarily focusing on convergence and divergence among different regulatory initiatives with respect to artificial intelligence. So the group has mapped uh, various initiatives in uh, AI governance from the EU to China to the US to Latin America to Africa. And their, their intention has been to put forward uh, countries or discourse that has not been so represented in the global discussions on AI forward. So they've centered a lot of the Global South initiatives in this report. Uh, the second theme covered by the report is, is they basically try to frame the AI life cycle uh, for gender and race inclusion. Uh, some of the questions that they're asking over there are, do AI systems and harmful biases reinforce uh, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia in societies? Uh, these are particularly important questions that the researchers have focused on. And then finally, uh, the, the, the third section of the report really talks about governing AI for a just twin transition. And when we say twin transition, it's the digital and the environmental transition. And uh, this section really explores the intersection of AI, data governance, and the environment. So, uh, having talked briefly about the report, I would, I would first invite uh, our host country representative, Mr. Nobu Nishigata, to say some opening remarks uh, and also perhaps contextualize a little bit the discussions around generative AI, which, which kind of prompted this reflection on uh, artificial intelligence governance through a multi-stakeholder perspective. Over to you, sir. Uh, good morning, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to the online participants, wherever you are. Uh, my name, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Nobu Nishigata from the Japanese government. I work at the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, and I'm doing the di uh, division director there, and joining uh, this network in maybe July this year. And uh, first of all, congratulations to you all to, to launch the report. Uh, just say uh, it's a very young organization to, to do this, but uh, frankly, I was very much impressed by <laughs> the content of the report. So, and uh, I understand that, that this work continues beyond the decide of even today. So, uh, we are looking forward to, to working with you together further. So then, uh, just a couple of things I would like to mention. Maybe just uh, from the content of the current report. So I my understand that uh, this report is not a comprehensive analysis type of report. Rather, this is more like uh, having the fresh uh, angle to, to what we have as for AI and what we have to do for AI policy development, those kind of things. Then like uh, just let me compare that with my previous work since I used to work at the OECD in Paris, and then I was in the team who developed uh, the council recommendation on artificial intelligence in 2019. Uh, you had the, the first uh, intergovernmental kind of policy standard uh, at that time. Then like I, I had the four years the, the experience out there, then, then compared to that report, for example, like uh, just the uh, Pratik introduced uh, the three main themes on the report that the first one was the inter, uh, interoperability in uh, AI governance. And uh, this is kind of resonated that what we had uh, the G7, uh, Japan hosted the G7 meeting this year. And then we had uh, in April, had a ministerial meeting for digital and the tech ministries, I mean ministers. 
And then like one of the, the major topic at there was the interoperability of the AI governance. Then like uh, for the G7 members, like uh, interoperability means that uh, the, we know that uh, in Europe, the, the negotiation for the, 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 the agreement for the AI Act is taking place. But on the other hand, actually that the Japan is the first country to, to propose the, the AI policy discussion in the G7 in 2016. It has been kind of getting long history right now though, but the G7 members uh, continue to discuss on what we should do for the, for the better AI, trustworthy AI, those kind of things. So then the, the getting back to the point of the interoperability, then it's like on the one side of the, the, this planet, like the, the country is working hard to establish a new legislation on AI. But on the other hand, for like Japan, we don't think it's too, uh, we don't think we need the legislation right now on AI. We need more innovation. We, ha we want to look at the, the possibility what AI can do for us because like for example, Japan is facing the severe problem for the losing the populations. So we, we already seen the, the decrease in the labor force in our country. So we need more machines you know, to, to sustain our economy. So that was a point back in 2016 that we asked the G7 members to discuss further on an AI because you know, we already knew that, that there could be some uncertain or uncertainty or risks in, uh, brought by that technology while looking at the many, many opportunities there. So that's the reason that we wanted to start the discussion and it goes to the OECD, UNESCO, and the many organizations right now. So, it's a great turnaround, actually. Then, then the other, then, 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 then for the, the for the this report, I mean, it's a I would say it's much wider focus. I mean, not the focus, but the wider perspective, many different perspectives on on the interoperability, and uh, it is kind of the, we can see some commonalities, but also the differences. And uh, this is just brought by this is great point, but uh, this network is uh, the discuss. The on AI policies through the global south lens, and this is a point that the G7 don't have actually. So to me, it's a very refreshing <laughs> things. And maybe about the, the 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 third topic of this report, uh, this is about the, of course it's on the environment, but of course it deals with the data governance, right? And then then while, while I was at the OECD, then my colleague was just uh, launching the recommendation on enhanced access to data and the sharing of the data. And uh, to me, that the uh, recommendation made sense a lot. But on the other hand, the same thing. Once we got the real case study within this report, then then like of course we saw some similarity between the report and the case study and the council recommendation from the OECD, but on the other hand, we saw some differences. And this is just brought again by the Global South Lens. So this is great, then, then I, I, maybe I should stop here. <laughs> but, uh, so then maybe just touch on it. I, I, maybe I should be back on this point, but just a flagging that like uh, the, the, this year, uh, the G7 leaders actually, I, I talked about the ministerial meeting, but the, the ministerial meeting, that the declaration went escalate up to the leaders summit this year. Then then the G7 agreed to, to establish what we call the Hiroshima AI process. And this is more focused on the generative AI and uh, just t uh, taking stocks of uh, the, the, the policy actions and as well as try to identify the challenges and risks, of course, as well as the opportunities brought by this new technology, so. Thank you, sir. So one key takeaway before we come to other panelists is that this report can inform some of the G7's work which is coming up from a Global South perspective. I think that would be a fantastic uh, outcome for the work that has been done here. Uh, and we, I, I just wanted to, I'll come back to the Hiroshima process in a bit. Um, I wanted to open the floor a little bit on generative AI. And one of the issues that the report talks about is around potential monopolization uh, around this technology. And they raise questions around how can we make generative AI 
systems and development more open, transparent, accountable. And uh, I wanted to come to you, Owen, to, to, to listen, to hear your perspective on how can generative AI systems be developed in a more open, transparent way, and what is Microsoft doing in this domain? For about three minutes. Uh, thank you very much, and great to be here. So I'm Owen Larter from Microsoft. It's a pleasure to be here, and congratulations on such a thoughtful report, which I think really does hit on three of the, the really important issues that we need to get right with uh, artificial intelligence. We need to make sure that we're governing this globally. We need to make sure that we're doing this in a sustainable way, and we need to make sure that we're doing it in an inclusive fashion. Um, we, we're very enthusiastic about AI at Microsoft, as you can probably imagine. So the generative AI that you talk about we think is going to be very powerful and helping people be more productive in their day-to-day -day lives. So we have our Microsoft co-pilots, which are helping people be more productive in using our Microsoft um, Office technologies. We also think that this technology is just going to be a huge opportunity in helping people better understand and manage complex systems. Um, I think you ask a really good question about how to make sure we're building this technology in an inclusive fashion. I think one of the things that we're really mindful of at Microsoft is hitting these fairness goals, doing things in an inclusive fashion. So that starts by having really diverse teams at Microsoft that are building these technologies. So part of our responsible AI program at Microsoft is our responsible AI standard. We have three goals in there, which are our fairness goals, F1, F2, F3. People can go and see our responsible AI standard, which is a public document that we've shared so that others can critique it and build on it. And a key part of these goals is making sure that we're bringing together people from a, a diversity of backgrounds to build these systems. So people with research backgrounds, people with engineering um, expertise, people that have worked on products, people with legal and policy backgrounds, and people that have worked on issues like sociology, like anthropology, so we have a really diverse set of inputs into how a technology or a system is being designed. I think more broadly, beyond that, there's a really big question on how we make sure that we're having a sort of representative conversation around governance as well. So we've been doing some work at Microsoft to try and broaden the range of inputs that we get into our responsible AI program. We have a responsible AI fellowship program that we've set up. Um, we've been running this for about a year now, and this is really pulling together some of the brightest minds from across the global south working on responsible AI issues to help inform the way that we are designing the technology, but also designing our governance program. So we have fellows from Nigeria, Sri Lanka, India, Kyrgyzstan. These have been really rich conversations to hear about how others across the world are thinking about these technologies and how to use them responsibly. And so we look forward to taking that work forward. If I, can, if I can press you a little bit on this point about openness versus closed AI development, we have seen several open source initiatives and there are several which are not. Where, how, how, where, how would you weigh in on this debate? Yeah, it's, it's a great question and I think open source is really important. I think open source is gonna be really important to helping advance an understanding of how to use this technology safely. Um, I think it's also going to be really, really important in making sure that we're distributing the benefits of this technology in a broad way. I think open source can play a really important role there. So we're very supportive of open source. We're a big contributor to the open source community. We, we open source a number of our models. GitHub, which people might be familiar with, is a, is a Microsoft company that has a big sort of open source uh, ethos um, in its uh, spirit. I think there are some questions around the trade-off between openness and safety and security at a certain level. And I think really highly capable models, what sometimes people refer to as frontier models, which are sort of at the, the highest end of capabilities of what we have today or beyond, I think there are real questions there around whether it makes sense to open source those, or if you are gonna open source them, or, or, or to, to explore different ways of making these um, models available, perhaps having some kind of uh, middle path where you don't necessarily release the model weights, but you advance uh, greater access to, to the technology. So I think um, attention there, but I, th I think it's really important that we appreciate that open source will be a really important part of the discussion going forward. Thanks, Owen, for those thoughts. And I think perhaps this is something that uh, is food for thought also for the next uh, work plan of, of this group to, to think about open source models and how does that, how can that be integrated in the policy discussions further. Uh, Sorayo, I wanted to turn to you also on this question around generative AI. 
And uh, the report also talks about some of the potential risks and harms uh, to democracy, human rights, rule of law, and so on. And one that I would like to focus on is disinformation and misinformation. Can you share with us what are the ways in which uh, generative AI systems can be used to, uh, f towards uh, spreading disinformation? And what could be some ways in which we could address this? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the audience for being here and the online audience. Uh, I'm assuming there are a range of com competing factors for you, F dinner, lunch, sleep. Uh, so thank you very much for being a part of this conversation. Uh, congratulations also to the team that's written the report. It been through most of it and it's a fantastic report. Um, it has a cadence and a thoughtfulness that comes from uh, collaborative work um, and it was absolutely wonderful to read. So congratulations on that. Um, delving into the specific question on uh, misinformation and disinformation, uh, I think it's critical to understand first how generative AI can enable the, the creation of misinfo and disinfo, um, what generative AI does or what the capabilities of generative AI can imply um, is that the cost of generating content, which is the base of misinfo or disinfo, is basically zero. So if you are capable of writing the right kind of query or code, um, it's quite easy to generate information. As language models are available in very many other languages, this capability is also therefore available in several languages. Um, so what has happened through generative AI is the reduction of the cost of content production to zero. Um, the internet and digital transmission in general has reduced the cost of transmission to zero. So when you put those two together, there's absolutely no friction to the production and dissemination of problematic content. And problematic content, I mean, there are several typologies in the literature, um, ranging, I mean, between misinfo and disinfo, there are differences, um, and the consequences of these uh, can also be manifold. Um, in terms of reduction, I think, uh, or stemming or curbing misinformation and disinformation, I think the report, uh, while may not specifically focusing on these areas, does put in place or talk about several approaches that could be used. Um, one, of course, is thinking about um, AI or AI, generative AI is embedded in specific contexts and taking a very context-specific lens to the stemming of misinfo, disinfo, which means um, understanding both the context in which this is generated. So is it corporate? Is it the state? Um, who's responsible for the generation of information, and then also spending time to understand how this disinformation process works. But all of this, you know, the, the takeaway I would say is that in the absence of um, broader protections embedded within the law, um, and I say this carefully, uh, conscious that, you know, misinformation, disinformation is a, is a, a polemical topic in its own right, um, but the rule of law as a as a guiding frame within which any inquiry about how to uh, stem this problem uh, might be the right approach to start with. Thanks, Ray, for that. Uh, Nobu, you've mentioned briefly the Hiroshima process and that it is going to focus on generative AI. Uh, we've heard that quite a bit over the past three, four days. Can you give us some specifics of what is it that it is looking at? What are the kind of principles? I don't know if it's advanced enough for you to share that, but can you, can you shed some more light on yeah. what they're going to come up with? Maybe a couple points uh, until now. I mean, that the process has not ended yet. And actually, the G7 delegation uh, task force teams, uh, the very hard negotiation they engaged in and then tried to finalize a report back to the, the leaders in, by the end of this year. So, but uh, still, though, as an uh, interim, uh, maybe we can, I can introduce that uh, the, the G7 ministers agreed on the ministerial declaration for the interim. Uh, it just uh, published uh, in early September, I think the 7th of September this year. Then, then like a couple of things, I mean, the discussion is more having more focus on the, the code of conduct from the private sector. That's the first one. 
So it's more like a voluntary uh, things, maybe. But on the other hand, we have some discussion, particularly just we are talking about the misinformation, disinformation type of things. Then, then we have some discussion about the watermarking, maybe the very aligned with what she said about uh, the, the proof of what just you know, made by AI, those kind of things. So maybe we are in a good alignment, I would say. Thanks. Those specifics help, huh? Uh, so I, I wanted to move to to this major part in the report, which is focusing on interoperability of AI governance. And I wanted to turn to Professor Xingli, who has worked very closely on internet governance. And uh, Professor Li wanted to understand what can we learn from internet governance uh, to inform AI governance when it comes to interoperability. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to be in this panel. I'm Professor Xinli from China, from Tsinghua University. And actually, 30 years ago, China connected to the internet, and we tried to participate and uh, get into their different level of management or governance. And at the higher level, actually, the government should need to permit this kind of access. And uh, from technical layer, actually, there are a lot of things. For internet, if you, we took a look of the evolution of the internet technology, there is IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force. That's exactly for the technical interoperability works, and the engineers as individual work on that. So, and then there are some other things, for example, the number assignment, which is regional internet registries, and the the names that I can, and, and a couple of years ago, there is a IANA transition, so that make it from US centric to the global playground. So actually, now it's chat GPT and AI, and I'm actually very excited on that, and I believe generative AI is something maybe even bigger than TCP IP. However, take a look of this area, we don't have IETF, we don't have this kind of organization, so maybe that's something we should take a look at that and work on that. So, and another thing actually I feel for internet from original technology and the evolute and the invention of the WWW and the other technologies and the people try to understand things and the, there is no blueprints for that. For generative AI, I have a feeling probably the regulation get into too early. We need to have innovation space, at least for academics and the technical group, we have some innovation space. Otherwise, it's very difficult to move forward. And uh, inside the country, probably it's okay for create an innovation place. Actually, I really want global, as a global village, academics can work together and to make things more exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, touching up briefly upon some of the, the ways of governing internet that you mentioned, this report actually uh, also talks about, under the interoperability dimensions, three things. Uh, interoperability at the level of substantive tools, uh, guidelines, norms, and so on. Then interoperability at the level of mechanisms uh, for multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, and finally, also talks about agreed ways of communication, which really talks about agree, ag agreeing on definitions, com concepts, uh, semantic interoperability. Uh, Jose, I wanted to turn to you. And uh, when you read the report, uh, what, what were some of the key aspects around, say, the recommendations around interoperability that struck out for you? And what do you think about that? Hello. Uh, well, thank you very much, Pratik. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, looking at the report, um, one thing that I that I that I identified is that we I think that we need to, considering that it is a report made by the by Global South uh, representatives for the Global South, I think that one thing that we need to advance in is in understanding what are the movements that we have in our own region. Um, and within this, understand exactly what are the policies that we are driving for, what are the narratives that we are, that we are pushing forward. And 
I think that when we look into regulation, um, it is, I think that it, it is a great thing that we are not focusing just on what's going on in the EU and other countries which, and, and regions, blocks, countries which are leading this debate, but also to those uh, within the global south. And I think that the, the main thing that we need to advance is understanding what are the points that are missing in the discussion. And I think that the report touches upon some of these issues. But I think that especially when we look at our region, the main thing is that we need to understand what are specific challenges that we have. And I would like to mention, for instance, issues of related to labor. We are not touching upon yet uh, the, the impacts that the development of these systems, that the, the industry, the tech industry as a whole, is having on, 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 on labor. And I'm not talking about just um, what would be the future of work, let's say, what uh, people working now in offices will need uh, in the next few years for, so that they are not left behind, let's say, in this, in this, um, in the advancement of, after the advancement of these technologies, but also what is happening with those so-called gig workers. Uh, in, my, in Brazil, at least, I can say that there is a, an intricate link between what's happening with the, 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 the people working in delivery platforms and issues related to race. And, and, and this relates also to their survival. Let's say in Brazil, um, the increase in, in the deaths by, by drivers, motorcycle drivers, has increased in, uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was like 80% in, in the last 10 years. And one of the reasons that many scholars uh, have been debating is the fact that we have new platforms that demand other kinds of uh, times of delivery which pressure these workers in, a, in a, an extremely different way. So I think that this is an issue that we need to tackle, uh, in, especially in our region. And also, uh, I think that we need to go deeper in the debates regarding sustainability. We're gonna, uh, the report touches upon this theme, and I think that it advances a lot in issues like uh, tackling techno-solutionism, techno-optimism, uh, because this discussion goes against, not to say merely, but the strict issue on energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, and etc. It is upon politics. We have seen, for instance, uh, um, some leaders, uh, let's say um, CEOs of tech companies, say talking about the, the issues uh, in Bolivia as that happened with uh, with the f uh, after Evo President Evo Morales was out and uh, supposedly interests regarding the, the minerals that Bolivia has, especially lithium. So I think that we also need to advance this. And maybe one last point that I would touch upon in this question so that I don't take more time is um, the debate on biometric surveillance, on the use of biometric systems, uh, especially for uh, surveillance purposes within and in the borders of countries, um, is another issue that we need to take seriously. And considering issues related to, for instance, talking about Brazil once again, the um, structural racism that pervades, that uh, passes through uh, the criminal system is just being automated and accelerated with the development of these technologies. And a tech fix on them won't solve it. We need to start thinking seriously about uh, whether we are going to establish moratories for the systems or especially banning, which is uh, one agent agenda that we are having very strongly in Brazil uh, that I think that we could talk about it in the next report, uh, how civil society is pushing forward for the banning of the systems um, over there. and. Yeah, I would say that it is one of the main, main uh, issues that we are currently debating there. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. So I think you put it three points, right? There is the, the data, which is uh, coming a lot from the Global South. There's the, the workers who are working on that data. And then there is the, the natural resources. And these three elements also come out quite strongly in the report or the case studies that we've seen in the report. Uh, and important for global discourse. Maintenant, je veux tourner vers vous, Monsieur Jean-François. In English, okay. Okay. So, um, for you read the report and you've seen some of the key challenges that are being mentioned. Uh, one of the things that the report talks about is also capacity building. 
And uh, how, how do you see, how can we strengthen capacities in the Global South, for instance, for engaging first with uh, processes, multi-stakeholder processes on governance, but also on the development use uh, of AI? Over to you. Okay, thank you so much. My name is uh, Jean-François Bombay. I come from Congo, uh, Brazzaville, and uh, I'm uh, AI, AI and uh, um, uh, emerging technologies uh, expert in regulatory. I'm working with uh, uh, RPC, what it is uh, the authority of regulatory in Congo, and uh, uh, we are expecting many things from uh, AI and uh, generative AI, but also fear about uh, uh, what is inside the box. You know, uh, AI seem like uh, a black box with uh, uh, many things inside. And uh, uh, so we are approaching that with three, in, by three points. So the first one is uh, um, uh, benefits versus risk. And the second one is about accountability with a contour. And the last one is about education. I mean, uh, uh, education is a, a big point uh, uh, in our strategy. We, uh, we created uh, uh, a uh, school uh, specialized in uh, AI from elementary to uh, a graduate one uh, in Congo to make sure that uh, 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 our kids and uh, to educate population in general uh, and uh, uh, make sure that uh, everyone can access to uh, uh, the technologies and to know what is uh, uh, coming in and uh, 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 how uh, innovation can change life and call, uh, 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 um, bring developments. Uh, uh, also, uh, make sure that uh, 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 no one will be, uh, uh, will be keep outside of uh, that technology. That's all. Thank you so much. Uh, I, would, I would now turn a bit to, to the second section of the report, which is really focusing on gender and race. Uh, but before that, I would also let the, the participants here know I'll open the floor uh, in about five minutes for questions. So feel free uh, to, if you have something in mind as well. Uh, so the report cites the U UN Human Rights Council which uh, said technology is a product of society, its values, and its priorities, and even its inequities, including those related to racism and intolerance. Uh, Sarayu, I wanted to turn to you and, and understand, do you have examples of uh, gender or racial biases in AI systems that have impacted individuals or communities? And, um, at the same time, uh, if you can also give another example where, which also the report also talks about some of those, uh, where AI systems have been used to actually combat gender bias that we have in society. So over to you. Thank you for that question. I think it's a broad and difficult one and I'll try my best to do as much as I can. Um, I mean, before we jump into the question of gender bias and gender in AI systems, um, and along with gender, other forms of biases such as racial, language, et cetera, do creep into AI systems. And it's hard to talk about them in aggregates because they do have their own specific politics. Uh, but having said that, there are some commonalities in these forms of But injustices. if you want to pick one, go with one and go with the specifics. Sure, yeah. sure, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, the... Before delving into the question of bias itself, I think it's important to tackle very briefly the forms of injustice that generative AI systems might have. Uh, one, of course, is the notion of data, data injustice that emerges in the context of, um, of gender, race, language, et cetera. Uh, and I'll probably tackle language. Um, there is also the injustice of labor, and uh, Jose here did refer to it, uh, but to imagine generative AI without talking about the labor of annotators who make generative AI in the sense that they label data, they annotate data, they categorize data um, in ways um, that are 
are accessible to um, researchers and scholars and builders of AI is very critical. Um, rather than delving into specific examples of language or gender bias that AI systems perpetuate, let's talk about generative AI and the labor of generative AI. A lot of this labor is done in the global south. Um, so millions of workers through various forms, platforms, um, sometimes through large, in the form of large contracted organizations, work on data sets and labeling data sets, and this is applicable to generative AI and several other forms of AI. Now, in order to label, and let's say you're labeling a car or a bus or a vehicle, um, or language, or gender, or race, the categories within which you label are often created in the West, which is that the company that's getting AI made is the one that's asking you to label, I don't know, like a llama or a cow, um, objects which are often unfamiliar um, to the people that are labeling. So the origin of bias in a certain way is, uh, of course, you know, the larger politics of how AI is made, but it also is mediated by very, very specific practices um, around language, around even English language language as, a, as being an input into large language models. So I think in order to talk about bias, it's important to talk about labor, labor supply chains, uh, the way in which AI itself is made, the way in which labeling and labeling categories are created. Um, jumping into how AI um, might enable or mitigate bias, I think um, there are several examples, but one specific example, and rather much more a concerted effort that is um, happened over time is uh, in the Indian context there are efforts to develop large language models in non-mainstream languages. Um, several of these efforts, fortunately or unfortunately, have been spearheaded by small organizations who work in specific communities. Um, and these efforts might make some of the benefits of generative AI accessible to wider communities in the languages that they speak. Um, so I'll pause here and hand back to you. Thanks, and I'll add to that uh, there are some questions online. I'll add to that also that, um, in, in, for instance, in Africa, there's a, a research group uh, working on low-resource African languages called the Masakane community. So if anyone is interested to, to work with them or join them or support them, please do check out. They're doing some fantastic work to create data sets in African languages as well. Uh, I would like to also turn to folks online, I don't see you here, but if there are some questions from our online moderator, Shamira. Yeah, if Shamira, you can pick one or two questions online. Um, yes, sure. I will go to the first questions we got. Thank you, Pratik. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. So the first question we got I'm just going there quickly. The first question we got was, what, from Prince Andrew Livingston, what international collaborations and agreements are needed to govern AI on a global scale? Okay, thank you. Can we collect a few questions? Uh, yeah. Yes, sure. And then the next question, I'm not sure if um, uh, virtual uh, attendees can raise their hand and, and pose their questions directly to you as well. L let's, let's see if there's a question from uh, in the chat and then we come back for uh, people who may want to take the floor later. Okay. And the next question was from Ayalo Shebeshi, and they had two questions. The first one was, how can we approach both the negative and positive impacts of AI, especially in Global South and developing countries that are replacing human jobs? And then, the next question was, how can we manage um, standards and interna international regulation of AI initiated by a bodies, uh, international bodies, 
um, such in part as part of the UN and other agencies and make sure that there is full agreement against uh, by all countries and nations. Thanks. Thanks, Shamira. So we have three questions. Two are quite similar, but I request you to hold on a bit because I want to collect at least two questions from the room as well, and then we address everything at the same time. Uh, anyone in the room who'd like to take the floor, please? Yes, please. Our colleague from the UN University. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Jingbo from UN University. Actually, this is much more intimate, so we can uh, communicate. So my question is related to capacity building. Uh, we know that AI is more of uh, less to do with the uh, engineering science, but more to do with the uh, empirical science, which means AI is not like an engineering product that you design and you know what's going to happen. Even the researchers, even the, the, uh, the designer, don't necessarily know what's going to happen. So along the way, they have to test, experiment to find out what are the risks, what are the potential benefits, extra. So my question is related to the difficulty in capacity building, because things keep changing. Even the designer don't know where to go. And meanwhile, there's misinformation, there's different sources of information. And how do we build capacity? How do we teach, uh, for example, the school children, or even you know, our peers, uh, my grandmother, for example? How do, we, how do we let them know, inform them of what's going on? Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have our colleague from EY. So. Uh, hi, Ansko Kuna from EUI. Um, in AI, as with a number of these digital technologies that are arising, we're seeing a blurring between the lines of sort of the more um, uh, political space of regulatory development and the technical space of standards development. Standards are becoming increasingly an instrument in the implementation side of the regulations. And so my question is around the capacity building of enabling a wider community of stakeholders to engage in that sort of technical side that has become an important part of the big, bigger policy instruments. Thank you so much. So we have five questions. I will not go to each one of you to answer because that will take us ages. Uh, who wants to take the questions around uh, governance and the governance framework? So there's one set around governance and how to make AI governance globally work. So I see Owen wants that. And then there's one set around capacity building, uh, both at the technical level, but also going to schools and so on. And so uh, first we go to Owen then. Yeah. Over to you. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, so I, I think this is a really important question to ask. How, how do we build a, a gl coherent global governance framework for AI? And I, I think it's important to realize that there is a difference between having a sort of globally coherent framework and having identical regulation in every single country. I don't think we want to get to the latter. I think what we want to have is a, a set of principles, probably a code of conduct that sets a high bar globally but then allows individual countries to take those standards and implement them in a way that makes sense for them. I really think on this global governance conversation, we've made an enormous amount of progress over the last year. We're coming up actually to quite a significant milestone. Uh, on the 30th of November 2022, you had the launch of ChatGPT, which really did change the conversation, it seems, amongst the public and amongst lawmakers around the use of these technologies and their impacts on society. I think the progress has been made the progress that has been made is, is really quite significant. I think you've seen that this week in the types of conversations that we're having here. Very importantly, you see that in the reports that um, has been put together. I think the, the G7 code of conduct through the Hiroshima process under the Japanese um, leadership, very, very important in terms of advancing this global conversation around how to, how to develop and use AI. I do think you've sort of got the, the building blocks in place now for a, a sort of longer term conversation around what global governance should look like. And I think as we have that conversation, we should sort of take a step back and think about a couple of things. I think the, the first is what ultimately do we want a global governance framework to do? And secondly, what can we learn from existing global governance regimes? And I think there's probably at least three things that we want this 
framework of the future to do. The, the first is around standard setting. I think standards are going to be really important in terms of advancing this coherent global regime. Um, I think there are great lessons to be drawn from organizations like ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, part of the UN family, where you have a really broad global representative conversation with pretty much every country in the world participating in it to set global safety and security standards that are then implemented by domestic government. So I think that kind of standard setting piece is really important. I also think having a conversation, and this was addressed in the report as well, around advancing an understanding and consensus around risks. I think this is a really important piece of the global discussion. You can look at organizations like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for example, again, part of the UN family, that I think has done a really good job of advancing an evidence-based uh, understanding of the risks around climate. I think we should be looking to do something similar when it comes to AI. And then maybe the, the final piece that I'll mention, and this sort of bleeds over into the capacity building conversation, is around building out infrastructure. So this Technology is moving so quickly, it's easy to forget sometimes that it is still relatively new. So the transformer architecture that underpins these large language models that are causing a lot of excitement and enthusiasm at the moment is only six years old, it developed in 2017. There are an enormous amount of open research questions that we really need to continue to invest in and tackle. We need to provide the infrastructure to academics and researchers to be able to, to do that. So there are really interesting proposals in the US, for example, for something called the National AI Research Resource. And this is an idea of developing publicly available compute data and models that academics would be able to use to study these technologies more and advance our understanding around them. So, so technology um, investment in the infrastructure. One piece I would really emphasize there is the importance of developing evaluations for these technologies. It's a very difficult space with a lot of open gaps at the moment. We need to make some progress there. Then the final point I'll make and then I'll stop talking is around this, the social infrastructure as well. So we need to be able to find sustained ways of having global conversations, building on I think the great progress that we've made this year and conversations like this to have a, a really globally representative discussion around these issues that allows us to quite frankly monitor how the technology goes keep track of things as technology progresses and be able to adjust and be nimble with how we're approaching these things as a, a global community. Thanks, Sovan. I, I saw that, Rosa, you wanted to come in also on the governance part. And then, Nobu, I'll turn quickly to you as well on how you see the global governance landscape evolving as well. Rosa. Yeah, thank you, Pratik. Um, when we discuss uh, the global governance of AI, I am, I have to admit that at the moment in which we are, I am quite skeptical that we are, at this moment, going to advance something in this regard in a way that does not mean a race to the bottom regarding uh, what are the parameters that we have to govern these technologies and their, and, and their impact. I mean, this is because we have a inter, an interplay of many narratives going on which lead many countries and like a this, I'm talking about geopolitics, uh, the geopolitics of these technologies and issues related to competition, to the supposedly AI race that exists and which has been framed as something quite similar to what we had during the, during the Cold War. So I think that this is a, a huge barrier for us to, to, to overcome if we want to have a reasonable uh, sort of global AI governance regulation uh, or whatever way we can frame this. And I think that, especially uh, if we consider the countries from our region, and I'm talking about the, the majority world, the global south, um, I think that there are forum, there are some fora that we need to push forward this agenda in order to have our interests in play. And I'm talking about the BRICS, G20 to some degree, as we have the presence of many countries from Latin America, from the African continent, from South Asia, and et cetera. And uh, this means a pressure on the global north because they are the ones who have developed these technologies, who are pushing them forward, and who are having their, especially their companies, dictate the agenda of what is a tech worth of our attention or not. And, but if I were to pinpoint uh, two points, and, and now I'm going to make reference once again to the issues of labor and of... Um, and of the extraction of uh, natural resources, uh, as it's commonly called. 
Um, I think that first of all, um, maybe I'll, I'll tell you here a story to illustrate this. Uh, in the beginning of the year, there was a genocide in, in the Brazilian Amazon of a specific ethnicity uh, called the Anomamis. And these people was being killed and had their territories invaded by gold miners, illegal gold miners. Um, and afterwards, uh, after a while, uh, our federal police re um, identified that one of the companies which was dealing with these illegal gold miners was selling gold to companies like Amazon, Apple, Google, and Microsoft. And so this is one thing. We need to deal with the issue related to the extraction of these resources and the impacts that they have in, in groups. Which, and of course, when we're talking about global governance of technology, we're, talking, we're saying also that there are groups that seem to matter more than others. And I'd say that the anomalies in this case seem to be in the, in the side of the ones that are less worried about. And um, so in this point, um, I think that we need to start th seriously thinking on, on how to deal with the, the materials that we are doing with the lives that we're impacting, and here once again, and I think that uh, uh, the point r r related to also the, the click workers and the ones who are helping develop this, these technologies who come from the global south, I think this is also a necessary discussion that we need to have in a global governance, be it through the control by workers of algorithms and of the, the decisions being made by these companies, or um, and of course, better working conditions for them and having the due responsibility of the companies who are uh, in the higher uh, edge of the, of the chain to be responsible for what's going on in these situations. Thanks, Jose. So in a way, the, the point that Owen was also making around accountability across the value chain and uh, evaluations and so on. Uh, should be part of the global governance frameworks and these evidence-based processes that are being talked about. Uh, Nobu, coming from a government, uh, where do you see is, is the global governance of AI going? And uh, what is your perspective on that? Uh, let me say that from the, the global governance, of course, as a, the one single country's government, and of course, we are looking at what uh, what is taking place in the global sphere, like here, or OECD, UN, of course, and UNESCO, etc., or ITU. Then, like, uh, to me, as a government person, I mean, I cannot write a code, honestly, but on the other hand, I can write a legislation in Japanese. This is my job, right? So then, you know, like, uh, we want to have some room to have our own, like, uh, you know, once, for example, once we have the treaty in the top, of course we respect the treaty, we sign it, and then we have to do something to, to be aligned with the treaty, right? So maybe, like, uh, for the, this case, I mean, it's, I'm not sure, it's maybe too early, or, you know, I, I recognize that some, the, particularly the Council of Europe people are for, you know, working hard to, to get a framework treaty convention. And I was in some kind of negotiation in the same way. But uh, so once we, just, for example, once we got some treaty on an AI, but uh, we don't want to have the very strict treaty and because it's a moving target. I mean, it, when it comes to the, like a human right or like a maybe for the, the, the war, et cetera, then, then it could be that way. But on the other hand, for this case of the AI, then, then we don't want to have the very strict up, upper hand and then so that we don't have any room to do our own. I mean, it's not only for Japan, but I mean, I would say it's for every government and every government workers out there. Then, so then they're getting by some group. So from the, the point of the OECD, then, then the, I mean, I'm not selling the OECD thing anymore because I graduated from there. <laughs> but uh, still, I mean, the, the, their principles is very simple, like a five value-based principles. Like, uh, you know, like uh, some people said about the accountability, yes, there is one, and the explainability, and the safety, security, robustness, those kind of things. And I mean, this comes first, I mean, the, you know, the ones AI systems dealing with the human, then, then like, we need a safety, right? Then, then of course, the, 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 the principle touches on the privacy and the fairness and the human right issues. Then, then that's it. Then on the other hand, we have five more principles, but it's more like a guidance to the government. Like, uh, you know, government has to work on the ecosystem. The government has to work on the, some, 
uh, the skills or c capacity building or etc. like a regulation if needed or maybe creating some test bed to the facilitate the, their their own work in the, every every place in the world. And of course, in the end, like uh, as a city's perspective, then we want to have more collaborations in the between the countries. So then the, the, the last principle is about is talking about the, the international collaboration in the, both in the policies and the techniques and standards, etc. So. So I mean, uh, I mean, you know, that there are a bunch of different international organizations, and the inter each organization has a different membership, different mandate, different etc. So it should be there. It's bunch, of, you know, it's natural to have that the very various type of the, uh, for example, recommendation principles, guidelines, etc. But still, I mean, the the bottom line is not very different. I would say, I mean, just the thing that OECD was about only the first one, but still, I mean. You know, I don't see that there many too many different things. I mean, you know, it's it's more like a version of each organizations, and they have to do it because you know each organization is a different body. So, but uh, getting back I, to the point, I can I can say that all the international organizations working on this are mostly coordinated. So coming from UNESCO, we we do work with the OECD, with uh, the Council of Europe, with the African Union, with the European Commission to ex at least exchange uh, where the, the work is going because I mean, we can the share the episode that the Pratik and I used to have the, the lunch over the river of the Seine in Paris, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly, so, so uh, thanks for that. I want to turn now to the second uh, kind of set of questions that we had, which were around capacity building. So I'll turn first to, to Mikey, then to uh, uh, Sorayu, then Professor Jingli, and to then Jean-Francois. Uh, what, what is it that we need to strengthen capacities across different levels and for different things from development of technical standards to development of governance to just using AI in our daily life to detecting misinformation. We had a, a wide variety of capacities that were mentioned. So maybe each one of you can pick on some. Yeah, over to you, Mikey. So the um, audience questions were about capacity building uh, as well as uh, how, how might be enabled a wider community to take part in this AI dialogues and debates. And uh, from the way I see it, they are sort of uh, parts of uh, one and, uh, and same. So of course we, uh, we need to uh, improve our efforts in introducing AI and, and data governance topics in, uh, in schools and universities and training citizens and, uh, and the uh, labor force, at least in, in basics of, of AI. And there are many uh, amazing initiatives uh, to be found everywhere uh, in the world. For example, uh, in Finland, where, where I'm from, um, I think a Finnish uh, AI strategy uh, managed to train uh, more than 2% of the Finnish population in basics of AI just in under one year. So that's a good, uh, good benchmark on what's possible if, uh, if there is a will. And something else I'd like to uh, highlight here is the capacity building of civil servants and policy makers since this is an area that would really deserve and, and require even more space in the AI uh, governance discussion. Uh, like Nobu just the moment I get said, like I can't write the code, I can write the regulation for Japan. And this is exactly what we should all understand and appreciate that we need different kinds of AI expertise to, to come in and uh, uh, work together so that we can uh, make this uh, global uh, AI uh, governance happen so that it's inclusive and fair for us all. And maybe you already guessed that the capacity building is my personal favorite uh, topic under AI. And earlier this uh, spring, uh, we were kind of brainstorming and uh, uh, discussing with the PNAI community, like which, which uh, topics to select for our report, because it's quite obvious that not, uh, not all AI and data governance related thing can be included and, cover, uh, co included and uh, covered in, in one report. And I was kind of secretly hoping that someone would, uh, would uh, suggest this capacity building. And I was a bit bummed when uh, that didn't happen. But over the past months, I realized that this is 
uh, sort of naturally interwoven in all of our report topics uh, in the chapter of environment and for gender and race, as well as for government. Uh, all the groups uh, in the end navigated towards capacity building and included some recommendations or sentences of that. So it's uh, really uh, in the core of, of all our topics and uh, I trust that in the coming years we will uh, have more focus on uh, capacity building in the global dialogues as well. Thanks, Mikey. Uh, Sorayu, you would like to take that? Thank you. Uh, you're absolutely right. There are sort of multiple categories of capacity building, multiple groups that need to engage with AI technology, different types of AI technology in different contexts. Um, so you're absolutely right. There's the ability of the population and citizens at large to engage with AI and get the best out of it in a certain way, or at least not be harmed by it. Um, then there is the question of how do technical communities from different domains, the legal policy governance community on the one hand, the you know, technical community on the other, how do they talk to each other? And maybe I'll focus on that very briefly. Um, I mean, my starting point on capacity building, um, adult education, whatever you want to call it, um, is the idea of mutuality, which is that both of these disciplines, both of these sort of uh, empirical starting points need to be able to talk to each other in a meaningful way. Um, just as much as uh, I have benefited from learning about embedding in large language models, I do think uh, technical communities would benefit from understanding, for example, the politics of category creation, given the empirical emphasis of generative AI. Uh, understanding non-negotiable human rights, the role of uh, state vis-a-vis -vis citizen rights. So having a sense of these is a mutual expectation and a mutual process. And um, I think that having various fora that enable these in a non-judgmental way and a recognition of various like empirical starting points is critical. Uh, the other, I thought I heard a question on the gains and harms of AI, including specifically on job loss. And right away, or? Please come back feel to free, free to take that as well. Right. Thank you. I think there was a question on some of the gains and harms of AI and specifically focused, if I understood it correctly, on job loss. Um, I do think that's a genuine challenge, particularly from some forms of generative AI. I do think as a society, we are still starting to gather the evidence and understand how different forms of, like the different applications of generative AI might cause different consequences, particularly around jobs. Uh, so the legal community, the tech community, the coding community particularly, are likely to be affected by the easy availability of and the capabilities of generative AI. Um, so that is understood, but I think the degree and extent um, is to be better imagined. There is an ILO report that does say that the impacts of job loss are more likely to be felt in the global north. Um, and consequently, the global south will actually gain from very specific types of jobs that generative AI will generate. Um, and I think we'll have to be careful and observe this a little bit more. It, it shouldn't be that, in a certain way, the capacities of generative AI ends up further ossifying the barriers and the types of jobs that exist in different parts of the world, um, that it's not some forms of click work alone that remain, um, and then some of the skilled jobs, particularly ones that relate to category creation, if you want to go back to that point, uh, remain uh, with existing powers. So I think we'll have to, we'll have to keep watching this job loss question, um, and then, of course, you know, humane conditions, just conditions for workers in different parts of the world. So I'll pause there. Thanks. Uh, Professor Xingli. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, capability beauty is also my favorite topic. Actually, people, I believe this creates, a uh, generic AI create opportunities, but also the challenges to the global south. And the people refer generic AI to three factors usually. That's the algorithm, the computing power, and the data. And actually, I would like to add another thing that's more important, that's education. That's very, very important. That's the human resource. And the traditional education sometimes need to be changed. I believe in this AI age, there's 
four things very important. The first is critical thinking. In the old days, students just follow what teacher said. However, if it's a rabbit or AI, then you have to have the ability for critical thinking. That's the first thing. Second, everything should be based on fact. Third, logical thinking. And finally, but also very important, global collaboration. The people need, okay, the youngsters need to have ability in these four areas. I believe it's important. So I really like to see the global AI related education system that maybe as many years ago, I mean hundreds of years ago, that's the creation of the modern university. We need some kind of new educational systems in the AI age. One of the lady professor from Stanford University, Fei Li, said, we need Newton and Einstein in AI age. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, a, a plug for UNESCO colleagues who are working on education and AI. They've uh, launched some guidelines on uh, generative AI and education. So if you're interested, feel free to check that out as well. Uh, I'll move to Jean-Francois. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I will switch in French. I'm more proficient in French. Alors, je vais vous parler en français uh, uh, pour être sûr de pouvoir uh, bien uh, l'exprimer, le fond de ma pensée. Alors, le développement de capacité est, uh, est quelque chose d'assez global. Uh, L'IA, ce n'est pas un tout uh, uh, sur lequel on peut uh, tout de suite uh, 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 mettre en place des, uh, des formations et uh, tout de suite, tout le monde sera au point. J'ai la chance d'avoir plusieurs points de vue uh, de l'IA. D'abord comme enseignant, comme formateur, mais aussi comme développeur de logiciels. Donc je développe des concepts sur, sur l'IA, j'enseigne l'IA et je travaille pour un régulateur. Donc je travaille dans l'aspect gouvernance de l'IA et je suis parent aussi. Donc je vois euh, euh, le monde dans lequel je, je travaille, euh, je contribue à concevoir le monde dans lequel mes enfants vont vivre. Et comme euh, 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 chercheur ou développeur dans ce domaine-là, je me donne aussi un recul. Parfois, je me pose la question, est-ce que c'est vraiment euh, ce monde-là dans lequel, euh, 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 ce monde que je veux, euh, que je suis en train de concevoir, je veux que mes enfants euh, euh, y vivent Et si oui, comment le rendre euh, euh, sûr Maintenant, pour revenir dans euh, le développement de capacités, au Congo, au Brazzaville, nous avons mis un programme qui s'appelle Yekola for Kids où on forme euh, les enfants aux technologies dès le bas âge de 6 ans et jusqu'à 17 ans. Alors, dans ce programme-là, on s'est posé plusieurs questions. Est-ce qu'on veut euh, euh, que ces enfants ou ces jeunes euh, puissent euh, euh, devenir des experts, tous des experts en, en technologie, ou euh, simplement les préparer au monde dans lequel ils vont vivre On a pris la deuxième option qui est celle de pouvoir développer les capacités cognitives des enfants en ce qui concerne les choix des solutions. Ils vont vivre dans un monde qui sera multi-solutions. Pour des gens qui sont aussi vieux que moi, on a grandi dans un environnement où les solutions, c'était ce que le prof disait ou ce que le parent disait. On n'avait pas beaucoup d'autres options. Lorsqu'on partait sur des options personnelles, on risquait soit une punition, soit avoir une mauvaise note à l'école. Il fallait faire exactement ce que le prof disait ou ce que le parent disait. Aujourd'hui, demain, nos enfants, et nous, aujourd'hui, nous vivons dans un monde où les, les solutions sont multiples. Et ce que nous faisons avec les enfants, nous développons leur capacité cognitive à pouvoir avoir le choix en termes de, euh, de solutions, un choix de, euh, de résolution de problèmes. Qu'il n'y a pas juste un seul chemin pour résoudre le problème, il y en a plusieurs. Donc, en préparant nos enfants à ça, ça aussi, c'est un aspect du euh, développement des, euh, des, des capacités, au renforcement des capacités dont on parle, comme euh, euh, l'intelligence artificielle n'est pas un tout, alors, nous avons pris l'option de pouvoir préparer euh, 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 les enfants non seulement à l'intelligence artificielle, mais à la manifestation de l'intelligence artificielle qui est un monde avec plusieurs solutions. Et euh, euh, voilà un peu cette approche que nous avons euh, pu développer au niveau du Congo, qui euh, pour moi euh, euh, me semble, nous semble en tout cas, être euh, euh, l'approche appropriée pour le cas du Congo. Merci beaucoup, Jean-François. Uh, now I will, I will turn on the final segment, and I see we have only 10 minutes left. 
So we have Shamira, our colleague online, who's worked uh, on the environmental aspects of uh, the report. Shamira, would you like to share some of the key insights from the discussions that you've had around environment and data governance and some of the case studies that you've presented in, in, the, in the report? Um, sure. Um, so particularly, AI and the environment and data governance is quite broad, but because the focus of the report was on the data governance aspect, uh, we focused on the data governance aspects at the nexus of AI and the environment. And in summary, our recommendations uh, collectively offer a multi-stakeholder perspective from the global south. And as mentioned by the other speakers to promote interoperable AI governance interventions that harness the potential of AI we focus on the multidimensional aspects of data for sustainable digital development and sustainable digital development um, is basically a, a way forward of leveraging digital technologies that also considers environmental aspects, economic aspects, and also societal aspects in one comprehensive Venn diagram, let's say. And we also discussed um, addressing historical injustices. We advocated for a decolonial informed approach to the geopolitical power dynamics that some people have mentioned um, in, for example, the materiality of AI when we consider the value chain and the, of, the, of the materials that go into AI, when we consider the multi-stakeholder process, is it really representative and are the standards made uh, in consideration of innovation ecosystems or global south uh, institutional mechanisms and situations. So we also talked about inclusion and minimizing environmental harms as many of the other speakers have highlighted as well. So in summary, in summary we highlighted that a just green digital transition is vital for achieving a sustainable and equitable future and a way that leverages AI um, in order to drive responsible uh, practices for the environment that promote economic growth, social inclusion, and essentially provide a pathway to a more resilient and sustainable world that actually meets the contextual realities of the global South. Um, most of the panelists have highlighted a lot of, have summarized and captured the report quite succinctly and as Mikey mentioned, we mentioned capacity building. We talked about geopolitics. We talked about the environmental aspects of AI. We talked about the data governance aspects. We talked about interoperability and uh, defining key terms. So I think it's a comprehensive report and um, I learned a lot during the making of the, the writing report and it was a truly bottom up multi-stakeholder process. Thank you. Thank you, Shamira, for sharing that uh, summary and also some of the important work that you've been doing on environment. Uh, I would now really open the floor here, not for questions, but for any recommendations that we have from the audience here on what could be other issues that this uh, group could explore. And this is also an invitation to you to, to join. This is a multi-stakeholder policy network uh, to, to join this group. So are there any, any folks who would like to share any recommendations or thoughts? Yes, sir. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Ye O Li from uh, World Digital Technology Academy. We do research, also, you know, uh, training and um, material for you know, education on AI. And yeah, uh, Pradeek, you mentioned uh, uh, UNESCO will do more you know, for AI training and education. Yeah, right now, for example, for our published book and uh, te textbook, you know, we provide to a lot of uh, universities, particularly in China, developing countries, and global south. So in the future, you know, um, UNESCO will have any process you know, for us to contribute or will you do training just yourself? 
I will definitely come t back to you on that bilaterally because the session is not on UNESCO, it's on the Policymakers Network, but happy to share what uh, we are doing and uh, link you with colleagues in the education work, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to share any recommendations? And perhaps if there's someone online as well, Shamira, uh, okay. So if, if there's someone who would like to take the floor online, I believe. Uh, the person who's raised their hand should put their video on. Okay, while we wait, we can go to the floor here. Hi, Ansgar Kuna from EY. Uh, I think an important aspect is going to be the question about how we do the assessment to test whether the systems are achieving what we want them to be able to achieve. And specifically, the question that is often raised is how do we assess the non-strictly technical aspects around the performance, such as the challenges around how the system is actually operating in, in the context of you know, places where they haven't been built, um, and whether they are having unintended consequences in, 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 in that kind of context on, for instance, the workers in, in these environments, or, or the way in which people are being categorized through these systems. So thinking through the assessment assurance process of how these systems are operating, especially on those non-technical um, properties of the systems. Thank you so much. So I'll now turn back to the panelists for three keywords which are future-oriented uh, and what this uh, group should look at. You see the screens, we have four minutes, so you have only three keywords each. Uh, maybe we start with uh, Nobu on the other side. Uh, three keywords, maybe we, we have to continue about the particular for this fora, the global south, education, and then maybe harmonization. Thank you, Mikey. Um, I choose these keywords, inclusive, future, and uh, P and AI. <laughs> Thanks. Shosa. Well, oh, difficult. Um, I would say let's keep up with the initiative. Let's include other things. Let's go further in the ones that we, are already that we have already debated. And this kind of initiative in this forum is fundamental. And thanks for the IGF for that, because it was in this opportunity that it, this was all possible. Thank you. Sarayu? Uh, global, not Global South. Um, workers and uh, rights. Thanks. Professor Shingli. Critical thinking and global collaboration. And global? Collaboration. Collaboration. Owen? Uh, so th three thoughts, I guess. One, sort of get, get concrete on capacity building and what we can be doing to drive things forward. Um, two, invest in evaluations, invest in evaluations, invest in evaluations. It's a, it's a major gap. Um, and across all of this, continue to bring together technical audiences with non-technical people that understand the socio-technical challenges of these systems as well. Thanks. Jean-Francois. I would say innovation, education, and accountability. Accountability. Responsibility. Well, thank you so much to our panelists here for your insightful thoughts, to the participants both online and uh, in person here. Uh, we invite you to look at the report, which was, as again mentioned before, developed in a multi-stakeholder manner. It's available on the website of the IGF under Policy Network on Artificial Intelligence. This work will continue, and uh, you are invited to join and expand this community going forward. Thank you so much and have a good day.